They didn't feel that, one, black people could read, two, that they were going to look in a book. Um, and I think that at each point, I had an opportunity, along with my friends, to disprove that uh, they had the wrong view about who I was and what I could do. So, so walk me through, I, I think some people are familiar with The Big Day as they've seen it on television so many times or, or heard about it so many times, but walk, walk me through the run up to finding yourself at this historical moment. Well, I, I think you have to, uh, you have to walk back to the uh, Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, which outlawed segregation uh, in public uh, public schools, and as I said, sometimes it seemed like a non-event, not an event, that uh, Little Rock School Board was attempting to comply with the Brown decision that the Supreme Court handed down. Sure. And um, I, I'm like any uh, uh, 15, 16 year old uh, that I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. It didn't, you know, I'm, historic moments are not something you go outside your comfort zone to, uh, to be involved in. But uh, the spring of 1957, the Little Rock School Board was. Uh, attempting to comply with the um, Supreme Court decision, at least that's what they said. And uh, they asked for students who lived in the school district who were uh, in interested in volunteering uh, to sign a sheet of paper. And I complied with that and signed the sheet of paper and didn't pay any, any attention to it. And as the summer of 57, uh, rolled along. I had a summer job. I was uh, uh, the uh, houseman at a uh, country club in Little Rock. And, uh, you know, I got, I got a hamburger and a soft drink and made whatever the minimum wage was at that time. And I was a happy camper. Well, as the summer uh, developed, it turned out that the governor of Arkansas said he was going to uh, call out the, the, the National Guard to keep us from going to Central High School. And so you created this, this, uh, this constitutional conflict. Again, you know, I, I'm like any other teenager that, that doesn't check out as the most important thing for my summer. But it also meant that I had to pay a lot more attention to this event because I was the only one in the 12th grade that's the paper and uh, was the only one that at the end of the day, the Little Rock School Board uh, decided to uh, invite us to become the Little Rock Nine. Um, my my uh, my interest did get heightened though when all of this activity around uh, our going to Central High School developed. Uh, in fact, my shorthand uh, said to me that uh, if all this attention is being paid to this going to the school, this has got to be some sort of big deal. And the uh, uh, summer of 57, uh, the governor, uh, who was Orville Faubus, announced that he was going to, uh, the night before we were to, to uh, go to Central, that he was going to use the National Guard to bar us from entrance. And I thought from that point on, uh, this must be something of importance. It, it was important, I guess, if I look at two events that that uh, 
sort of uh, centered me. One was the Montgomery bus boycott, in which involved uh, Dr. King and Rosa Parks and a number of other people. And then the uh, the second event was the murder of of, uh, um, of uh, Emmett Till. I'm drawing Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Yeah. That, uh, Emmett Till. Emmett Till's murder was in the spring of '57. Uh, the Montgomery bus boycott began uh, that winter, and and you spent some time, you know, looking at uh, uh, events around civil rights. I didn't uh, see myself as a um, as one of the shock troopers, um, but I thought that uh, if this was going to change the way black people were perceived. Uh, the way that they had an opportunity to uh, um, uh, interact, elimination of Jim Crow, all of these things leading up to a change that I thought was great for me. I believe that uh, uh, non-events uh, were something that we shouldn't pay attention to. And then thirdly, um, I saw all of this as helping to uh, improve the atmosphere around uh, Little Rock for myself. So the, the other students were all much younger than you. So you, you, in effect, volunteered as opposed to your parents sort of signing you up for it. So you must have had oh, some, yeah. some your, your parents yeah, were activists as was, well, right? My, uh, my mother was a school teacher. My, my uh, aunt was uh, uh, a teacher. My grandfather was a, a, letter, a postal carrier, uh, and he had tried at some point to vote in the Democratic primary, and he was pushed away uh, with the uh, use of a gun, a rifle. Um, my mother was also, and my aunt, um, involved in a uh, court case for equal pay between black and white teachers. And um, the teacher who brought the suit, uh, the moment she brought the suit, she was fired from uh, Little Rock School school District. And she, uh, my mother and a number of other teachers pooled uh, money together to provide income for her during the course of that year, as she was the plaintiff. Anyway, the uh, the uh, lawyer that handled that case for uh, the black school teachers was Thurgood Marshall. Wow. So yeah, we were we we were activists without uh, spending a lot of time uh, knowing that uh, this was going to be the beginning of a revolution. Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something you're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it until I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. And you were also a, an Eagle Scout, right? I was an Eagle Scout. I had uh, uh, become an Eagle Scout 
the uh, that spring. So before I was at Central High School, uh, I said I always used my merit badges to figure out what I wanted to do next, and uh, uh, that helped me. Um, uh, that that helped me get through the idea. Was, it must have been perplexing, right? You, you, you come from a, a family of people who are contributing to the community. You're an Eagle Scout. You have a summer job. You are a good student. How did it feel as a kid to have this sort of intensity of hatred and disagreement and objection to a person who is effectively doing everything right? That must have been strange to wrap your head around at such a young age. Yeah, well, you know that's that's one of the uh, inconsistencies of of uh, segregation and, and Jim Crow at that period of time. That the people that I knew, I knew the we had a a doctor, we had a pharmacist, had a a lawyer, um, Daisy Bates, who was uh, publisher of the uh, uh, weekly newspaper. All these people were making a contribution, and yet, if you listen to the uh, to the segregationists, they would say that the black community doesn't contribute anything. That uh, they are uh, obviously uh, not making any impact, positive impact, and that uh, we've got to figure a way to keep them. Uh, keep them segregated and keep yeah. them away from, from the majority community. So, so the day comes and you're, you're there for your first day of school. I imagine this is the scariest moment of your life. Well, to uh, have somebody with bayonets and uh, rifles pointed that they're keeping me away, they're letting these other students go to class uh yeah it's 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 a it's a difficult uh uh issue to get your head wrapped around but you also knew that being a black person at that point in time that if, if they were working that hard to keep you out it there had to be something going on that was worth pursuing and that uh this represented to me, an opportunity to change the atmosphere, change the uh, the uh, uh, matrix of how we were considered worthless, and that uh, it made me feel that I had I I, I should be there. I mean, yeah. it was my opportunity to say that. Uh, uh, you got the wrong person. I'm obviously uh, important, and uh, I want to be at, inside that school. I, I love that. That's such an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah, the, the reason they were trying to keep you out is that it was very, very valuable, and they were trying to keep it for themselves. Even though it was dressed up in racism and, uh, and, and hatred, it was really about self-interest. Yeah, and and you came to the conclusion that um, you were making a real contribution to the community, much more so than they were willing to admit, and that segregation and Jim Crow and all of the rationale that they threw up to keep you out didn't make sense. I should be there, and I'm going to... I'm going to stay there at that front gate until you let me in. Yeah, I, I interviewed George Raveling a few years ago. Uh, he's one of the, the pioneering basketball coaches. He, uh, he, he was there on the steps of the, uh, the, the Washington Monument, uh, the Lincoln Monument, when, um, when King gave the I Have a Dream speech. And actually, Martin Luther King gave him the speech as he walked down the stairs. And uh, George was telling me that his grandmother would, every time she saw him, she would say, you know, George, why did the slave owners keep their money in books? Why did they hide their money in, in the books on, on the plantation? And he said, I don't know. And she said, 
be, because she thought the slaves would never look there. And he, he was he was saying that because they they knew books were valuable, but were trying to deceive him from thinking they were valuable. And that's precisely why he has spent so much of his life reading uh, the things, precisely the things that they're trying to keep away from you are the things you deserve and should be seeking out. Well, I, I appreciate that because I was at the march as well um, and uh, had an opportunity uh, to hear Dr. King speak. Well, and, and I, I don't know whether you're aware that uh, he came to my graduation, my high school wow. graduation. I didn't know that. Uh, he, yeah, he was, um, he was giving a speech in uh, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, which is maybe 20, 30 miles from Little Rock. And he decided that he wanted to witness my graduation, he came up, sat with uh, the woman who I mentioned, Daisy Bates, and my family. And so I always say that I'm one of the few people in the world that had Dr. Martin Luther King at their high school graduation. Wow. But it, it, over the years, I had an opportunity to see him. And, and I, as I said, I was at the march. Um, for, for jobs and freedom, uh, that uh, Dr. King was there, uh, A. Philip Randolph was there, uh, Marlon Brando was there, uh, and it was it was an event to uh, to be. I bet. I'm, I'm... So so when you walk into that school for the the first time. What, once you sort of get past the barriers and once you're inside, what was it like to, to be showing up to, to your senior year of high school, which is difficult and strange and weird, even under normal circumstances? How did you how did you navigate that year and get your education while so many people were, you know, probably rooting for and trying to uh, make you fail? To have you fail. <laughs> well, I I think that uh, because they worked hard at trying to make me feel, made me also stronger in, in terms of trying to succeed. Um, I paid a lot of attention to uh, the fact that I needed to study. In fact, I had uh, a couple of tutors that were working with me. I had a course in physics that was really um, very difficult for me. But uh, I, the reason I got through it is I had a, my tutor was a physics professor from the University of Arkansas Medical School. He was white. And uh, every Saturday for the entire school year, he and I had tutoring sessions that helped me get through that. So there were people who were trying to see that I would could succeed, but most of them, most of the students were um, really afraid being led by, by their families or their community that somehow they should fail they shouldn't help us. Sure. They shouldn't reach out. And um, I think that uh, it's a sad state. When I uh, look back at what could have happened uh, that didn't happen, but I was committed that I was going to go through that year. I was going to succeed and that um, it was going to be a year in which uh, um, I would pass my courses and hopefully get on to college. It, it must have been strange. As you said, some, some people were rooting for you. Some people were rooting against you. At first, the governor sends the National Guard to keep you out. And then Eisenhower sends in the Airborne to let you in. It must have been strange that you have, you're seeing the absolute worst and the best of people at the same time? Well, it, it, 
It was. And, and the fact that President Eisenhower sent in the 101st Airborne, uh, which are, you know, uh, elite troops uh, to, to help us get into school was another indication that this was, this was a big deal. <laughs> I needed to make certain that I succeed at it and that uh, there were people around the country who cared not just those in Little Rock, or Arkansas, who wanted to see me fail. Is it is it hard for you to, how, how do you go through the world knowing that some of the people are really good and some of the people are really bad or that, that some people have, you know, Martin Luther King talked about how we all have a North and a South in our soul and that there's a battle. Which side are you going to be on? How, how do you... How do you navigate seeing up close uh, the sort of the two paths that individuals could take? Uh, that, that seems like it would be hard to unsee. Once you've been screamed at by uh, horrible racists, yeah. once people have thrown rocks at you, once people have threatened your family, how do you unsee that? Well, you, you knew growing up in Little Rock that this was an attitude that a number of people had, and that I was taught by my family and by my friends and my community that I had value. I, I was worth worth something. I was I was important to me, and that as you mentioned, the uh, uh, the coach who said that they hid their uh, their money in books because they didn't feel that. One, black people could read. Two, that they were going to look in a book. Um, and I think that at each point, I had an opportunity, along with my friends, to disprove that uh, they had the wrong view about who I was and what I could do. And in that way, I could always read, and they wouldn't know that uh, I had... I had an uh, idea where the money was. <laughs> so I, I think uh, particularly growing up, I felt this way. This feels like it was all a very long time ago. Um, but I was just reading to my son. Uh, there's a children's book. My son's four. And Ruby Bridges wrote a children's book. Um, and uh, I'm reading the back of it. And she's only 66 years old. And you're uh, 79, 80. It's not, it wasn't that long ago that this happened. Uh, yeah, no, this was, uh, this was recent. In fact, we were a year before Ruby uh, when she went to school in New Orleans. That Little Rock was the uh, 57, I think. She was 58, 59 um, when she went to uh, school in New Orleans. But, but no, this this is less than a hundred years, and we're still fighting ideas that uh, uh, culminate in racist views about what people can and can't do, and that's why I think it's important for you to read to your son that uh, we're ready to take on these challenges. Uh, we're ready to disprove backwards thinking that people have about other people and that uh, we're ready to show the world and uh, that uh, th this is a changed atmosphere, that this is a place that uh, we're able to show that we can, uh, we can grow. We as a country have to grow. Uh, we're going to, a world in which uh, people, uh, as Dr. King said, hopefully judged by the content of their character, uh, not who they are. So race, uh, justice, uh, an opportunity to show that uh, we all can make a contribution is where we are at this moment. I, As I was... Uh Thinking about all this, I I, um, I reached out to my family because my grandmother uh, and her side of the family is all from Bearville, Arkansas. 
And, and so I, I asked, I said, you know, uh, did my grandmother was, was the high school she went to segregated? Um, and they said, uh, actually, um, I guess the senior year of her high school, uh, her, the Berryville high school was destroyed by a tornado. And so she went to little rock high school. She, they, they sent her to little rock high school. I think this is 45, 46, uh, the last year of her high school, she went to the same high school that you did. And, it was interesting to me to think, one, again, this is not that long ago. I spent a lot of time with this woman when I was growing up, uh, that my own grandmother pre went, went to high school 10 years before you did, and it was segregated. But the thing that struck me about it was it was never once talked about. Like, you know, we talk about privilege or we talk about advantages. It never once came up that my grandmother got to go to a high school that kept out a significant percentage of the population who still had to pay taxes, who still had an equal right to go there. It's, it's interesting to me, we talk about sort of how advantages get passed down. Like it's never been thought about in my family that we, you know, I think people go, oh, we're not racist, but we still don't think about how the, that racist system benefited us at the expense of another group. And, and I, I will add that my my dad went to Europe and fought in World War One. Wow! Now he, he went he went to France to help. Right. French. And when he came back, a little like he couldn't vote. Uh, and and it, it, it it's a it's a series of positions that when you stand on your head, it doesn't make sense. They can't justify it. They 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 can't logically uh, explain it. It doesn't doesn't translate, and that's why I think as soon as we can get as many of these old vestiges of uh, Jim Crow and segregation, whether they are statues or or, or behavior or or availability of uh, opportunity, all of it doesn't we have an opportunity our generation your generation your your uh, your children to uh correct that and make certain that we don't have to live in in the past like we've done in the uh before yeah and you you mentioned emmett till earlier uh i was i was reading an article um wright thompson wrote an article in the atlantic about emmett till in the barn where he was killed and the most stunning part of that piece uh, that, really, that really brings home how recent some of this was, is that the woman that Emmett Till supposedly whistled at, although she, it, it sounds like she actually made it up, but the woman at the center of all of that is still alive. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and if you ask her what happened, she'll probably tell you she doesn't remember now. Uh, so that we are a, a nation that uh, uh, I think our strength is our diversity. Uh, and yet we fight hard not to recognize that. So that it seems to me what we need to do, especially with generation of your kids, is make sure that all these blind alleys that we've been going up and down that we get away from it and get on with recognizing who we are, why we can't be a better country than we are and what our strengths are. I, I mean, it's, it, it is, uh, it is mind boggling that no. we still are fighting that we're still fighting the civil war and that uh, uh, <laughs> we can't give it up uh, for a, a better future that's right in front of us. I, I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, the irony of, uh, and, and maybe sometimes it's easier to see it in when you look at another country, right? The irony of uh, Nazi Germany is that uh, the, the second world war is ultimately won in large part uh, through the work of Jewish scientists 
who are driven out of Germany by the Nazis who come to America in Britain and do all sorts of important work for the Allied cause. And I think that's one part of segregation and racism and Jim Crow that we don't think about. It's not just that it was morally wrong. It was also economically stupid in a profound way, because I think about uh, the, the illustrious career that you've gone on to have and the work that, 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 that many of the, 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 the other members of the, uh, the Little Rock Nine have, have gone on uh, to do. It just, just being ordinary uh, parents, uh, raising good families, having good jobs, and to think that systematically the laws of this country prevented that from happening. If you had been born one year earlier or one year later, actually, you might not have been able to have the career that you've had or made the make the contributions that you've made because we would have been shooting ourselves in the foot by holding you, you and people like you down. That that's Diversity is a strength. And yet, as you said, we seem to fight it at every step of the way. Yeah, well, well, I, th- I think that uh, in a uh, in a world that seems to become coming more diverse, that if we're going to uh, recognize our strengths as a country, we've got to recognize our assets. And uh, it seems to me that the fact that we are not a uh, we are a multicultural uh, country with people from all over the world. Um, we we uh, need to get on with, with proving why that's important and not see it as a hindrance. So, so you experienced this, you, you saw sort of raw, unadulterated, unadulterated, violent racism up front, right? You saw the crowd screaming at you. You saw like literal, uh, 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 troops having to hold it back, um, that doesn't just disappear, right? It seems very distant now, um, but, but that didn't just disappear. Where does, that, where does that energy go, you think? Where does the energy go? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It ought to go towards an improvement of opportunity for everybody in this country. Um, and I think the sooner we, we figure that out, you know, hopefully leadership um, is going to spend some time trying to work on that. I, I think uh, the president administration, uh, obviously, it, a very important accomplishment to have a vice president of the country that is, is not a white male. Sure. Uh, that, uh, in fact, that probably does greater uh, opportunity for uh, for young women to see Vice President Harris uh, than it does to see her as as uh, as a person of color. I I I think that you know you're um, interviewing. Um, you're recognizing that um, we are a different place, um, that when you talk to your son uh, and, and ask him, uh, what does he see, you know, the, the, <laughs> the opportunities in America, he, he, he would probably tell you he sees Martians, which wouldn't be bad because we're spending all this time <laughs> trying to get to Mars, and if anybody's up there, we're going to be shocked out of our our pants. Um, But we are at a point, we have an opportunity to look at the future as something different than our history. And um, I feel great about that. I, I see it in my family. I see it with my children who are all adults and grown up and families that they have. Um, Can America be different for the future than what we've seen it become in the past? And I'm an optimist. I believe that that's possible. 
And uh, that's why I wanted to go to that school. And that's why I believe, you know, change is, change is good. Well, and that, that was sort of my question. I, I, think, I think maybe we've told ourselves a story that as soon as the schools were desegregated or as soon as, uh, you know, the Voting Rights Act was passed, that this all went away. And I guess what I'm saying is you, you saw these people up close. You, saw, you met their children or, or maybe you went to class with them. They didn't magically get transformed just because Ernest Green sat next to them in history class or physics class. So how have you seen that evolution in, in people? Like, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is it feels like we're having this reckoning now in the United States because we realize that just because we made a few changes doesn't mean that that everyone's soul was transformed, that we suddenly that we suddenly grew out of this many century long tradition of thinking about things the wrong way. But but you're answering the question <laughs> because it's more than just reckoning and sitting next to me in a physics class. It's a long history. And but the but is that it can change. There are enough people who are willing to uh, spend time trying to make it permanent, not just window dressing. Sure. And if anybody thinks that simply because uh, we did one act, or we made one one change here, or that, or that we uh, had a black president or a black vice president. We had a black president. Uh, all of that. Th it, it's not that it doesn't mean anything. It's just that we have been so long at trying to prove that people don't have qualities of change that we don't know when change comes, and I'm a witness that change is possible, but it is awfully difficult. It is awfully difficult. And that what we got to do is get people committed to stay with it and not give up because we got some knuckleheads who uh, want to resist change. I mean, I don't know where they're going to go. You know, they go to Iceland uh, or someplace. They go to go to Mars, I guess. But they've got to be willing to accept the fact that we're all human beings and we've got something to contribute to the plus side of this country. Well, I love that you said that you're an optimist because I think people, it's not that they use that as an excuse, but it's not enough to be, you weren't just, hey, I think the future is going to be better or I think things will work out. Your optimism was also connected with the actions that you took, right? Um, so I think people sometimes think progress just happens. Of course it does, but progress happens because individuals and groups come together and make progress together. And they, and they continue to demand change. Um, I think it's, as I said, my, my dad fought in World War I. And, and yet, he was uh, working on this abstract idea of equality. And when he came home, there were a whole ton of people who were resisting. He considered himself equal to me. Who, who does he think he is? Right. And I'm here to say that you and I and your kids and mine and my family and other members of the nine, a, a big world out there. But we're not going to give in to the knuckleheads that said change can occur and that I've got to live in the past. Uh, I'm going to want more. Uh, I'm willing to fight for more. And uh, I think we have an opportunity to make the change stick. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because it, it is fascinating. Uh, the, you, you talked about how we stand on our head. We can't make it work. I just looked, I just looked up uh, uh, Orville Fabus, the, the governor of, uh, of Arkansas, who, who worked so hard to prevent you from going to school. 
He was in the U.S. Army from 1942 to 46. He was a major in the infantry, uh, participated in D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge. So he, he goes overseas to fight fascism, to, to, to fight for freedom and democracy, and then comes home and is an active participant in the suppression of those very ideas at home. It's, it's, it's so baffling uh, that uh, I can't, I don't know how you make sense of it. Well, I, I, and I agree with you. I don't know how he makes sense with it either. Part of it was that we thought that Little Rock and Arkansas were a bit more, more progressive than some other communities in the South. Uh, that's why I thought that my first day at school, I would have an opportunity to meet some students um, who were interested in what I thought of the world. And, and I had an opportunity to figure out what they thought of the world. Mostly what I met the first week were students who were afraid to have any contact with me. Um, that uh, they were going to be ostracized. They were going to uh, uh, be told by their friends and neighbors that uh, they couldn't uh, have a relationship with me because <laughs> I was going to turn them around. I don't know. I don't know what the outcome was supposed to be, but here we are in uh, a new century, uh, ideas that uh, your, your grandmother who went to Central High, same that I did, uh, didn't become the uh, flaming communist of, of Arkansas, right? Right. She was, <laughs> she was a person that you still admired. And what I think, is that your grandmother and other people who went to Central when I was there, we need to hear from them, that the place didn't fall apart, uh, that uh, uh, Little Rock Central has had a number of students who have succeeded, done well. Uh, it, it was considered one of the jewels of, of the Mid-South in terms of uh, the building, and that I wanted to go there because I knew that it was a ticket to a better life. And that's what education has been centuries. So that uh, uh, let's get on with it. <laughs> let's Otherwise, make it. I think it's worth pointing out because, again, we can tell ourselves a story about these things retroactively that sort of absolves us of responsibility. Uh, I'm talking about everyone but you in this case. But, um, you know, it seems like in retrospect, obviously, the governor of Arkansas was wrong, obvious that segregation was wrong and that this was a, a sort of a really small minority that had hijacked things. But I'm, I, I, as I was saying, I just looked him up. Uh, according to Gallup's most admired man and woman poll of 1958, Orville Fabus was one of the 10 most admired Americans uh, at that time. And so it's, it's, I think it's really important that we look at history and remind ourselves that oftentimes the right thing, the proper thing, what, what in the future will seem like a clear cut case of right and wrong, you know, we can, as society can get completely incorrect. And that just how many people were on the wrong side of this issue as it was happening uh, probably including my own family. Again, it, it's the fact that we don't talk about it probably makes me think that we were on the wrong side of it. But but I think it's important, you know, as issues happen today, that you don't just default to what all your friends and neighbors are thinking, because as we see with Jim Crow and segregation, these things that were unfortunately very popular at the time, we can be way off base. Well, and, and I think recognizing that that uh, you can be on the right side of history, uh, but it's probably takes a lot of it. And that the likelihood is that your neighbors are not going to applaud you. Yes. Um, uh, I think we 
we've uh, relegated Dr. King to godlike status. Now, there were many times when his efforts were being uh, regarded as wrongheaded and uh, going in the wrong direction. I, I yeah, I imagine he wasn't given given a standing ovation at your high school graduation. Well, they didn't know, they didn't know who he was, and uh, uh, luckily, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, the Little Rock police force didn't have any idea who Martin Luther King was so that uh, they couldn't point him out. But to, to his credit, he wanted to see my graduation and I honored that he was there uh, taking part of my graduation. Yeah, he probably risked his life to be there in, in, in some sense or another. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and in the end, he did give his life, right? It's not like he was so popular that uh, we made him a saint, you know, in his own time. I mean, he was assassinated. The, that's part of the history, and uh, it's important to, to remember that. And that people who go against the grain are not necessarily the ones that we cheer on. Right. But let's uh, recognize the fact that they make an enormous contribution to make this country what it is today. So how did you come to talk about all this with your own children? I, I imagine uh, you wanted them to have a normal life, but you probably also, um, and you probably also worried about their safety. And how did you talk to them about not just racism and its history in America, but how did you talk to them about you know, activism and being of service and, uh, and, and, and values. How, how did you talk to them uh, in your own family? Well, they, it, it ranged from uh, my uh, uh, attempting not to bury them in the history, in, in my history, uh, having them to uh, discover it both on their own and uh, with some help from me. My uh, uh, Mackenzie um, probably will tell you that she discovered it on her own, that one day in, uh, in a history class, uh, the teacher brought out a picture of the nine and she looked and saw that, that Terrence Roberts, who was with me, was one of the nines, and she had a perplexed look on her face. And I, I think that, that those of us who have been fortunate enough to be part of history, uh, to uh, uh, show up in, in a history book, uh, you want your kids to appreciate what you've done, and that's where we really were. Um, all of them, I spoken at their classes. Uh, I said, I've, I've, I've uh, Adam is uh, my son who is a, a history professor. I've, uh, I've been at every level of, uh, of uh, scholarship that he's been uh, so that, that uh, I've tried to make myself available to be the the outside lecturer, and uh, hopefully not to not to bury them in my history, but to recognize that uh, we've tried to make a contribution to the country. And and you went on. You were you served in the Carter administration, right? I was assistant secretary in the Carter administration for job training, employment, and training. Uh, I spent four years there um, and then uh, went from there to uh, uh, spend time on a Wall Street firm, Lehman Brothers, and, uh, uh, and now my wife is trying to get me to retire. I'm, I'm, I'm semi-retired every now and then. I, I do a lecture like this. 
but uh, uh, I'm proud of my kids, uh, the work that they're doing, and, uh, you know, we continue to push on. I, I got a birthday coming up uh, in September. That'll, uh, that'll be the big A.O. Wow. So, could, could, uh, you have, could you have imagined as a senior at that first day of school at, at, at Central High School that uh, this would be the, the trajectory of your life, that you'd, you'd serve in a presidential administration, that a Democratic uh, you know, governor from the South, no less? Uh, could you have imagined yeah. that? No, the the uh, opportunity to serve for President Carter was great. Uh, I've known uh, a number of presidents. Uh, obviously, Bill Clinton is someone that uh, I have a personal relationship with. Uh, President Obama I went to his uh, inauguration. Uh, so you know, it, it's it's. It's a it's a moment that I cherish, but I always thought that if you gave me a shot, that this is the way it would turn out. I love that, and and that I think again to go to this self interested argument, I think, uh, and I read this once about uh, Anne Frank. You know, you read uh, Anne Frank's diary, and you see this precocious, you know, beautiful young girl who, who's struck right. down in her prime, um, that she's really a stand in for a generation of other talented young people that we would have never heard of. And I think when I think about your story, I think uh, Americans should see both a triumph, but it's also a reminder, you're a symbol of all the other talented, ambitious, confident young men and women who could have served in so many different capacities that were, were wrongly deprived of that opportunity and remain and people who remain deprived of opportunities for various reasons. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I hope that people see the upside of it, that it's, uh, it's the opportunity that we've, uh, closed out to a lot of folks. Um, I'm sure my dad, couldn't imagine, you know, things that have happened, but I believe that, you know, the future is, could be even brighter than what we've experienced. And there's no reason why we ought to cut off the lights and, uh, and uh, turn the lock on the door and not look for the future for how we're going to get more talent uh, and, 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 and get more plus out of it. Well, as, as we wrap up as, as, as America, uh, in the last year and a half has sort of begun to, to wrestle more publicly with some of these racial issues, something we should have done a long time ago, of course, how, how do you, how are you thinking about and what advice do you have to the next generation of, uh, Americans period, black or white about how we, keep uh, the flame going, how we keep moving forward uh, where we can and need to make progress. What, what advice do you have? Well, I, I think that uh, my story, uh, other stories uh, prove the point that we, uh, we don't look under all the right places to find talent. And um, my hope is that we've become a lot more inquisitive about where we search and seek out people to make a contribution to this country. And as I said, when we started this discussion, I'm an optimist about the future, but we got to work at it and we got to believe that uh, we can improve considerably where we're looking for talent and contribution and people who can make a uh, difference. Uh, so I, I want to continue to look for that difference. And uh, I believe we can make it, we, we can make it work.
How, how do you think we can do a better job of that? Is it, is it education? Is it, uh, how, how can people do a better job looking for talent uh, that, that, as you said, is not being uh, given an equal shot? Well, I, I think you, you've got to uh, be willing to, to look at lots of different <laughs> corners and underneath cans and not just the uh, usual. The, let's not look at everybody who graduated from the Ivy schools. Uh, let's see if we can't find some other uh, places that that people congregate and have you know maybe homeless shelters. We aren't we aren't looking at uh, uh, for talent in all the right places, as the song says. And uh, my hope is that the last two or three years prove that. Uh, We've got to be more creative about where we look and how we support them. Yeah, not just looking uh, looking for them, but also thinking about the ways that our systems and our institutions are making it harder for people than it needs to be and, and thus preventing them from thriving and succeeding. Um, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, Ernest, this was truly an honor for me. I'm so glad that uh, McKinsey connected us and uh, your story is very inspiring and, and I, I'm honored to, to be able to, uh, to tell people about it. And uh, I'm glad to see you're doing well, that you've ridden out this, uh, this insane pandemic and you're still with us. And uh, I hope you're with us for a lot longer. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I look forward to, uh, to getting this book written that, <laughs> getting my story told, uh, but uh, my family, my wife, my children, my sister, uh, and extended family have been the rock of my support. And uh, I believe we can, one, we can do better. Two, we've got to do better. And three, that, uh, better is out there waiting for us to find them and touch them and bring them in. I love that. Well, writing books is one thing I do know a little bit about. So if I can help in any way, you just uh, have Mackenzie reach out and uh, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever I can. Well, thank you. I, I enjoyed our time together and uh, let me know what kind of response we get. I, I will indeed. Th thank you so much. Uh, this was great. I'll let you go. And I, I hope you have a wonderful Monday. All right. Thank you. And same to you. Bye, sir. All right. Goodbye.